This is the guidance film then for studying the improved access to care, improvements in public health and hospitals, medicine provision, um, and how things have improved across the 20th century. Clearly from the date there, we're moving towards the end of the course and gives you a chance to reflect on how medical provision has changed over the range of the course. So can you unscramble the keywords below associated with the recent topics? I will go through each of these words. You are expected to know each of the words and not be able to unscramble them, when they're from, why they're important. Now you can pause the film at this point and make sure you can unscramble all of those words. Remember, in itself, that's not enough. Why are each of these words significant? As we go through the correct answers, please make sure that you amend your notes. Number one is a magic bullet or an antibiotic. The first one of those was Salvaris in 606. The most famous one was penicillin, which is number two. Discovered by Alexander Fleming, but turned into um, a practical drug that could be used on a massive scale by Florian Chain and against the backdrop of World War II. Salvaris in 606 was the first antibiotic discovered which would kill syphilis. Fleming, uh, the scientist who discovered penicillin but didn't turn it into a practical medicine. That was done by Florian Chain. DNA, the genetic instructions for human beings inside each cell in a person's body. Understanding DNA will enable us to prevent disease in the first place. And the discoverers were Watson and Crick. They made the final discoveries of DNA based upon the work of other people that came before them. Clonazil was the second antibiotic. Gene therapy, using it and understanding DNA and its sequencing, changing that sequence in order to cure people. And Rosalind Franklin, uh, the great unsung hero of the discovery of DNA, she did most of the work, but Watson and Crick made the final discovery. So can you identify these answers from the course of medicine so far. Who accidentally discovered penicillin? Alexander Fleming. Which two individuals do we associate with the mass production? Florian Chain. What drug company do we associate with the mass production of penicillin during World War II? Pfizer. What war was penicillin developed during and had a massive impact and influence on? World War II. Who was responsible for the development of the first magic bullet? That's Paul Ehrlich, the German bacteriologist who'd worked for Robert Koch. What was the world's first magic bullet? And that was Salvaris in 606 for the treatment of syphilis. The development of the second magic bullet was by Gerhard Domiak. What was the second magic bullet called? Prontosil. What disease did Silvaris and 606 target? And that was syphilis. A 
and Protocell targeted blood poisoning. Who do we associate with the discovery of DNA? Watson and Craig. What year was DNA discovered? 1953. What two other key individuals do we associate with the discovery? Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. So improvements in access to health care. This is going to mirror the breakdown of laissez-faire. Laissez-faire was the policy describing the way in which governments didn't look after the health of their people, um, not out of malice, but because there was little that they could do. Government was small, there wasn't enough money, and even if they'd had big government and lots of money, they didn't know what to do. Throughout the 19th century, laissez-faire breaks down. In part, that is to do with discoveries that are being made, which says there can be something done, and also the fact that Britain becomes much, much wealthier and consequently has the means of doing something about this. As Britain becomes wealthier, also more and more people get the vote, and more and more ordinary people will make choices that means the government has to do something to improve their lot in life. So as we go down the list here, you can see how the government becomes more and more involved. We have the development of science and therefore huge breakthroughs. We have the first Public Health Act in 1848, which was not compulsory. The second one in 1875, which was. Then we have other wider influences that lead to the government becoming more involved. In 1899, Britain fights a war in South Africa, the Boer War. When Britain recruits an army to fight in this war, up to one third of the men are deemed to be medically unfit to fight because of basic health problems. If there's going to be a major European war, Britain in theory may not have an army with which can fight. In 1904, as a response to this, the new Liberal government bring in reforms, um, as it says here, to get the biggest impact for the minimum amount of money spent. They direct that towards midwives, health visitors, free school meals, and making milk available in school. 1914 to 1918, we have World War I. A huge impact on Britain, a huge impact on the way that Britain is governed, and everyone is either fighting directly or indirectly, and the government acknowledges it has a responsibility to look after those men that come back, and those that do not. The idea of a land fit for heroes. In the Second World War, medical care is totally free. Civilians find themselves on the front line because the bombing of British cities comes directly home. And after the end of the Second World War, the British people vote for a government that means that they will keep their free public health care. This stems from the Beveridge Report of 1942, which proposed that after World War II, there is a free um, health care system, free at the point of delivery. You pay for it in tax, which will become known as the National Health Service in 1948, because in 1945, the Labour Party were elected, promising to establish the World National Health Service, which was done in 1948. This provided free health care at the point of delivery through taxation, and everything was free until 1952, when due to monetary shortages, prescription charges were introduced. So, improved access to health care. We have a list here of nine ways in which the government gradually introduced more and more support for the people. What you need to do is plot these statements onto the graph, measuring the impact of these one being low, ten being high. Stick the statements onto the improved access to care diagram. Make sure you do this in chronological order. Decide how much each statement improved access to healthcare, using the scale from one to ten to all of the statements. 
one would be indicative of not improving access to healthcare or to a limited amount of people, and 10 would be highly improved access to care. Which improved access to care? Which improved access to care most? Then some specific information on the creation of the National Health Service in 1948. This is the year where we mend, measure the end of laissez-faire. Um, the National Health Service was established on the principle of cradle to the grave. A hundred years previously, the government passed the first Public Health Act, which said it would be nice if people had clean water. One hundred years later, the government committed to look after you from the cradle to the grave. How does the NHS improve access to care? All of these factors are paid for and supported and provided by the National Health Service. Free dental treatment, free family doctors, maternity and child welfare, health visitors, health centres, vaccinations, ambulances, medicines and appliances, specialists, blood transfusion, medical research and teaching and training of doctors and nurses. A completely comprehensive health system. What you now need to do is a poster or a mind map explaining the creation of the National Health Service in 1948 and you will get the information from the previous slide and the pages in the textbooks identified. There is the success criteria. Why was the NHS set up? Why, what did the NHS pay for? What impact did it have on people's lives? What problems were there with the NHS?